The film kicks off by taking us back to the summer of 1985 in Elkridge, Illinois. In this small town, something dark stirred, targeting the senior class one by one, following an alphabetical order. Anyone connected to them also met the same fate. Back in the present, we see a couple, Charlotte and Roland sitting near a cemetery. Roland looks uncomfortable and wonders why the girl wanted to come here and what she finds so fascinating about this creepy place. The girl tells him to shut up and enjoy because they are going to do something very fascinating today. She tells him that today is the anniversary of the incident that happened two years back. Roland wants to keep things simple and suggests watching a movie. But Charlotte, who's into weird stuff, wants to connect with the town's mysterious residents, especially those whose souls might still be lingering around. They banter, and Roland asks Charlotte why she's so into this strange stuff. Charlotte opens a spooky book and says that he will soon find out. She asks him to hold hands and then opens the book, chanting verses in a strange language. As she utters the strangely menacing words, the atmosphere turns dark and spooky. Roland starts to get nervous and questions if they're doing something crazy. But Charlotte, not bothered in the least, continues to keep going. Meanwhile, on another side, we see a very weary and strung out patient in a mental hospital who's reacting to the spells. The more Charlotte chants, the crazier this man gets. He thrashes around and shouts at no one in particular. He utters dreadful words of how everything would end and how the menace would once again come back. On the other hand, back at the cemetery, the air feels weird and the ritual reaches its peak. Roland's nervousness turns into real fear, and before they can react, a strange unknown entity attacks them. The couple shouts but it might just be too late, as they bear the unexpected consequences of what they've done. Poor Roland though, he didn't even want to do any of this. The screen shifts and we see fleeting visions of a girl blowing dandelions and a monstrous entity growling something in a distorted voice. The scene shifts back to the spring of 1985. We see a young boy who's happily listening to music while jogging along a quiet path. He is wearing sportswear and there is a locket resembling a gold medal hanging from his neck. Midway through his run, the boy feels a strange feeling creep up on him and stops. He carefully looks around the woods to make sure that everything is okay, and the feeling of danger that he sensed was just an illusion. After calming his troubled heart, he continues jogging. But then suddenly, he trips and falls. Before he passes out, he sees a strange thing approach him and screams. Out of nowhere, a bright light bursts out from near his body and the scene cuts. Back to the present, we see another man, rather healthy looking compared to the athlete, appearing out of nowhere in the forest. It is the same place where the previous boy from two years ago had fallen and passed out. The man confusingly looks all around himself as if he cannot believe he is there. A strange glowing yellow light appears in his eyes and quickly disappears. It feels as though he just teleported there, with the way that he is acting. The tension in the air gets worse, and the man starts running backward in a really confusing way. Finally, he manages to get away from the menacing forest. Two weeks later, we see a boy named Jake, who is troubled by a weird dream. In his dream, he sees Zeke, his old friend, saying strange things sounding like a warning about evil that is about to come. Jake gasps awake and vows to go find his missing friend that just visited him in his dream. The next day, he goes in search of his friend, crossing the same spooky forest. After searching around for a while, he finally stumbles upon his friend's secret hideout. As he cautiously approaches a door and enters, he sees pictures of the earlier incidents on the wall. While he's looking at them, Zeke appears and asks if Jake wants to know more. Jake confirms that he wants to understand what's going on. Zeke then tells him to come with him and he will explain. They can't stay in this spooky place because it is dangerous for them. Outside, near the food corner, Jake is puzzled by Zeke's sudden disappearance and all the chaos that followed. He finds out from his friend that Zeke went into hiding to escape from the authorities, who thought he was connected to the strange events and held him responsible. They both feel the weight of what happened before, and Zeke admits that he thought he had controlled the evil force back then. He had been thinking that it was finished for good. But now, with two new slaughters, Roland and Charlotte, similar to the earlier ones, Zeke and Jake realize that the threat is still there. In a summer tone, Jake tells Zeke about a personal tragedy involving his brother's terrible demise. Turns out that the athlete that we just saw earlier was Jake's older brother. He passed away in a strange and mysterious way. Only his grizzled remains were found in that dreadful forest. When Jake tried to speak up about the strangeness regarding his brother's slaughter, nobody believed in him. Afterwards, he found a tough gang called the Anacondas that took him in and he became like a family to them. Jake, now battle-tested, says he's ready to face the evil force that's been once and for all. Zeke and Jake team up to get this demon down for good. Night falls and the scene then cuts to the eerie darkness of Linda's house. Linda, feeling uneasy, heads downstairs to watch TV. While she's watching, strange sounds start coming from deep within the TV. The room gets creepier with each spooky noise, and it's like the atmosphere is soaking in these ghostly sounds. Suddenly, something terribly evil starts appearing on the TV screen. Linda's eyes start bleeding and, after a few weird surges, they begin to glow with an eerie red light. Her face also shows this strange, fear-induced glow. All of a sudden, tensions reach a breaking point and there's a horrible explosion. Blood splatters all over and Linda falls limp on the floor. Meanwhile, at around 8.30 p.m., back in Jake's house, we see Jake along with Zeke. The latter is looking really anxious and he tells his friend the bad news about Linda's demise. Zeke tells him how he went to Linda's house and saw ambulances surrounding it. 
They both struggle to come to terms with the tragedy. The troubled Zeke thinks for a moment about the demon's last slaughters. He tells Jake that last time he was able to stop the devil because he knew the evil force was attacking people in alphabetical order. But now it seems as though it has changed its tactics. Linda's last name, Prescott, becomes an important clue, suggesting a pattern they need to pay attention to. The previous names were also out of alphabetical order. Urged by Zeke, they look through Jake's yearbook to find potential targets. They notice the name Roland, and as they investigate further, they finally discover a connection. These people are involved in the art club, theater, and a band. Zeke thinks the evil force might be going after artists, a theory supported by recent victims. Since they have known that the evil isn't just random but methodical, they find out that this time around, it is focusing on people who are into artistic things. The scene shifts to the police station where we see Officer Campbell. He gets a phone call and picks it up to inform the person on the other end of recent victims, Roland Hartley and Charlotte Davenport. He also talks about Linda Prescott joining the tragic list. The body count rises to three in a single month. A sense of urgency and dread intensifies as the officer suspects Zeke of these horrible slaughters. There is a picture of his superior sergeant on his table. He picks it up and questions what he would have done if he had been in his place. The scene then transitions in the street where we see an unsuspecting boy crossing the dimly lit street. As he moves forward, he senses an ominous energy that seems to tighten its grip on his surrounding. Each step echoes with a foreboding uncertainty, haunted by an invisible evil spirit. The air around him grows thick with an unsettling heaviness and he starts hearing heavy breathing from the shadows, its source obscured in the darkness. As he turns the corner, the streetlights drop in a disconcerting on and off, casting the surroundings into fleeting glimpses of horror. Terrified, the boy runs for his life. Racing towards refuge, he seeks solace in the elevator. Once inside, he quickly presses the rooftop button. Upon reaching the desolate rooftop, he finds a corner that is well lit and settles there in an attempt at carving out safety from the unease. He cowers there for a moment and then notices the lights above him that start to flicker and buzz in a dissonant symphony. With dread-laden eyes, the boy stares at those twisted flickering lights, his gaze locking onto an indescribable force lurking within. All of a sudden, a blinding flash appears and, in an instant, both the boy and the suffocating darkness vanish into thin air. The scene then shifts to the home of a woman named Angela Baker. It is nine in the evening. We see a girl who is enthusiastically playing the drums. The girl plays loud rock music and is practicing her craft but, in the background, an unseen evil force surrounds her. Amidst her play, the sinister energy abruptly seizes control of her hands. The girl is terrified and screams but to no avail. The demon that possesses her hand compels her to inflict harm upon the drumstick that she holds. Sadly, despite her struggle, she also falls victim to the sinister entity. The scene shifts back to the police station, where we see Officer Campbell. He takes out a recorder and plays a previous interrogation carried out with Zeke. In the recording, we can hear Zeke's voice as he tells the skeptical and intrigued officer about his visions. Zeke says that his premonitions and visions led him and an unidentified girl to identify the evil entity's pattern and effectively stopping its deadly spree. The officer in the recording merely laughs at him and says that he is being ridiculous. Despite the incredulous response from the officer, Zeke insists that the danger persists, urging the officer to be vigilant on patrol unless he wants more casual. Despite everything going around, so far Officer Campbell always looks holed up inside his office. His face shows his concern but his disposition speaks otherwise. The next morning, the scene shifts to a church. There we see Father Michaels, leaving the place. As he walks down the street, he is suddenly ambushed by the man who appeared in the forest. He drags the father inside the bushes and takes over his clothing. Then the man re-enters the church where he stumbles across a troubled sister who is having strange feelings about approaching danger. The boy strangely looks like the father, even in the flesh. He cryptically warns the sister about the lurking evil, emphasizing its proximity. The sister becomes even more scared and says that they need to gather the others and warn them. In a chilling turn, this man's warning takes a sinister tone. He warns the nun against taking action and leaving everything to God. After dissuading Sister from taking action, he approaches her menacingly and the scene cuts out. He then exits the church afterwards. The scene transitions to Zeke's room, where he confides in Jake about the escalating incident. The victims, all involved in the arts, prompt Zeke and Jake to connect the dots. Their conversation revolves around the ominous pattern targeting artists, culminating in Zeke suggesting Julia Lockley as a potential target. Julia turns out to be Zeke Sr. who was one of the most into art. They go to visit her. As Zeke and Jake approach Julia, seeking her assistance, they encounter skepticism. Zeke cryptically reveals the return of the evil force, emphasizing the need for caution. After Zeke is done with telling Julia about the evil happenings, Jake asks him to talk for a minute. He questions Zeke's personal connection to the woman, hinting that he is only here because he likes her. Right that moment, Julia tells them about her fascination with dark arts. She says that she has been looking into spells, curses and healing stuff. Hearing this, Zeke smiles at Jake and tells him that apart from liking the woman, it turns out she would be an asset too. The setting shifts to the police station where we see our usual officer Campbell sitting tight. He receives a report about a missing person, Thomas Emery. 
The guy in the picture looks exactly like the boy who vanished on the rooftop earlier. The officer observes the picture, taking in the summer news. He then makes a call to another officer named Mooney and asks him to be on the lookout for a guy named Thomas. It seems that he is considering this boy as a suspect in the recent incidents too. The scene abruptly changes to a dark and horrifying alley where the same possessed guy from earlier, concealed by the roadside shadows, silently observes Zeke. Zeke himself is running around and is drawn to a dark place linked with a past incident. He arrives at the place and encounters a terrifying voice emanating from the shadows, with an eerie tone. The demon tells him that he will soon come to know everything. While crossing the streets Jake came to a theater where, on a large screen, we see a boy looking at his surroundings and a terrifying evil voice is groaning. All of a sudden, the evil entity beside him attacks the poor boy and it. Zeke takes the first row seats of the empty theater and swiftly falls asleep. With the gruesome scene right in front of him, it is a wonder how he can just fall asleep like that. The next day, the scene cuts to a library where we see a blonde-haired boy. He enters the place and his eyes immediately land on an antiquated typewriter. All of a sudden, the typewriter, all on its own, starts to write a cold message on slick paper. The boy looks at this, horrified. The paper before him displays menacing words, telling him that his fate is sealed. An intense fear grips the boy as the words materialize before his eyes. Stricken with the boy's instincts scream for escape. His eyes wide with dread. He thinks to run but before he can do so, his body acts on its own and repeatedly slams the typewriter, each impact echoing throughout the place. Shortly after, the poor boy falls on his back, his face smeared with blood and his eyes lifeless. Back at the theater, Zeke gasps awake from his nap. He looks around the theater and then quickly gets up to head back home. The following morning finds Zeke, Jake, and Julia gathered in a lounge, grappling with the enigma of the strange haunting experience Zeke had the previous night. He mentions how he went to a decrepit old mansion. Jake perks up at this and tells them that it could be the Bellevue Manor. Julia also chimes in saying that she heard that that mansion is linked with bad omens. Zeke tells them that he knows someone who can tell them more about that certain mansion. He then goes off to his high school to meet Professor Reinhardt. The man delves into the town's dark history, linking Charles Bellevue, the town's founder and the above-mentioned mansion's owner, to the dark arts. Turns out Charles built this school on a cursed burial ground and wanted to bring forth an evil. The curse that he put on this school was meant to come alive a hundred years later. He tied this task to a ghoul task with a specific deed. This specific deed being the seemingly random slaughter plaguing the town. But as Zeke had stopped it last year, the curse wasn't successfully unleashed. Zeke then asks why these incidents have been happening again two years later. The man replies that perhaps a new ghoul has appeared, and the rules of slaughter have changed. He mentions that they may find more if they visit the manor, but also advises the boy to proceed with caution. The group contemplates the significance of the curse resurfacing two years later and its connection to Zeke's visions. They then decide to investigate Bellevue Manor as the evil force intensifies the urgency to confront the paranormal hub. They all get fired up to face this evil and end it for good although they do not know how. Nevertheless, it is better to be motivated than not. The scene then transitions to a girl painting in an open place on a canvas. She is listening to loud music. Suddenly, she hears some noise from the bushes. Dropping, or more like throwing her canvas aside, she calls out to whoever is trying to scare her. She warns the intruder that if he didn't show himself then she would just call the cops on him. Just then, the ghostly figure shows itself. Unimpressed, she makes fun of his dress. Unfortunately for her, the ghost does not like her joke and throws sharp tree branches at her. The branches cruelly pierce her stomach one after the other until she falls down, lifeless. Poor girl. This badly dressed ghost can't take a joke. Back on the other side, in a dimly lit bathroom, Zeke is faced with a terrifying discovery. Standing in front of the mirror, he stares intently at his own reflection, as if searching for something beyond his understanding. Zeke begins to rub his eyes for a while, as if trying to clear the fog or uncover something. Then, suddenly, the mirror reflects the ghost's dark form. He warns Zeke that the puzzle would be solved this time, referring to the dreadful slaughters. Paralyzed with fear, Zeke instinctively rubs his eyes again, hoping to chase away the nightmare that has materialized before his eyes. After a suspenseful pause, Zeke opens his eyes. He takes a deep breath and gets ready to go. The scene shifts and we see a boy with a camera. He is walking through a deserted path, taking pictures. The place looks quite remote and empty. As he descends down the steps among the bushes, he takes out his headphones and blasts music while enjoying photography. Walking forward, he manages to reach the shore of a sea. There he takes a few pictures and then moves forward, going nearer to the water. The boy then moves atop the huge rocks and starts taking more snaps of the forest. Just then, he sees the fleeting vision of the demon through the camera, quickly removing the lens from before his eyes. He looks, but there seems to be no one. Again, he looks through the camera and sees the ghostly figure. This menacing demon then starts chanting some evil verses and attacks the poor unsuspecting boy. He too, falls prey to the ruthless demon's bloody ways. The scene then shifts to the house of a girl named Trixie, where she hears news of the new victim succumbing to the evil forces on the news. She then makes a phone call to her friend Chad, asking him to come over. As she waits, we see her eyes gloss over with a devilish green tint. In the meantime, we see our resting officer, as per usual, in his office chair. Right then he receives a phone call, informing him of yet another incident. After the line cuts, he sighs and exclaims saying that he is not cut out for this job. 
The scene then cuts to a boy named Sean. He is busy writing his college essay when there's a knock on his door. As he opens it, he sees the father that was possessed earlier there. The father greets him and asks if he is well. He says that since his friends are mysteriously being slaughtered, so he was worried and came to check in on him. Sean tells him he is okay and asks to be excused since he wants to continue writing his essay. All of a sudden, the father gets possessed and, in a menacing voice, warns Sean that his demise and the town's destruction is near. Scared, Sean quickly closes the door and retreats inside, sitting down on his chair. He sighs in relief but his relief is short-lived. The father mysteriously materializes before him and takes the poor boy out. Sean, before even finishing his essay, falls prey to a gruesome evil slaughter. Back at Trixie's house, we see Chad sitting down on her bed expectantly while Trixie goes to fetch something. She comes back with a knife and plunges it into the poor boy. She laughs maniacally as the boy rides in pain, taking his last breaths. After doing the deed, she leaves the house in the same blooded state. On the other side, the trio finally arrive at the evil manor and make their way inside. The insides of the manor are dark and bathed in an evil aura. All of a sudden Zeke hears a voice beckon to him and follows it. After a few steps, he stops. Jake calls out to him but when he turns around, it is no longer their companion Zeke but rather the evil demon that has now possessed him. Jake suddenly feels lightheaded and sees the spectral vision of Zeke, who tells him that in order to defeat evil, he needs to defeat him. Turns out that Zeke is the ghoul, or the container that kept the curse going after he had defeated it two years back. Coming back to his senses, Jake sees the possessed Zeke about to attack him. However, the attack is stopped by Julia, who holds a crystal in one hand and starts chanting at the demon to go back to hell. After a struggle, Julia's spell finally overpowers the demon who falls down catching fire. Finding the chance, Jake and Julia run for their lives, leaving poor Zeke in the smoldering fire. The scene then shifts back to the police station where we see our depressed officer resting in his seat. Just then, he gets news of the manor catching fire. Finally, this man decides that it is time for him to get a move on. He rushes to the site, and there, he watches the place burning down in all its glory. Fast forward to two weeks later, we see Jake on a call with Julia. They talk about how Zeke sacrificed so that they may be at peace. Jake decides that the least he can do is pay tribute to Zeke's memory. As he cuts the call, we see the possessed man on the other side listening into his conversation. Jake arrives at the cemetery to visit Zeke. After a heartfelt speech, he turns around to leave and we see his eyes gloss over with a sinister green tint. Turns out, it is not over after all. The scene then shifts to the chilling epilogue. The camera pans over to a chaotic evening in Elkridge with black clouds looming over it. Despite poor Zeke's struggle, the evil seems to have prevailed and is slaughtering people without a care. Back in the mental asylum, we see the patient whom we saw in the beginning, having another panic attack. He keeps shouting that all this is happening because they didn't believe him when he said that evil is coming. The movie finally ends with our poor officer Campbell also falling prey to the demonic entity, while hiding down in his basement.